Hey, the topic, my topic is known unknowns. You might recognize this as being a quote from uh, Donald Rumsfeld. In fact, I got a, a video clip here. There are known knowns. There are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we now know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we do not know we don't know. Okay, so uh, Rumsfeld is talking likely about political and military intelligence, but I think this concept of known unknowns really has a lot of applicability when it comes to scientific uh, knowledge. In fact, I think we can think of scientific progress as being driven a lot by these known unknowns, uh, because really that we can think of I think of this as being sort of a spiral staircase where we're, you know, we're we're cycling through the uh, through these different types of knowledge, and known unknowns is, is a, a big part of how we progress scientifically. And I think we can see this in, back in history, in 19, or 1878, uh, there's this German phys physicist by the name of uh, Philip von Jolly, and he was advising Max Planck, young Max Planck at the University of, of Munich, and he, uh, he basically told Max Planck, you know, don't bother about physics, we've already figured everything out. There's no need to, you know, for any more physicists. And, well, it's a very good thing that uh, Max Planck didn't listen to him because he went on, of course, to discover, be one of the fathers of quantum physics. And, of course, M Einstein also hadn't yet uh, <laughs> yielded his big uh, discoveries. This is how I imagine Albert Einstein spoke. I'd never he heard him, a recording of him. <laughs> so, yeah, so if we, if we look at this, so, so let's take the case of quantum physics. You know. Back then, in, in uh, 1878, we basically didn't know what we didn't know. And there were certain experiments, like the, the double, ex double slit experiment, where we found that light behaved sometimes like a particle, sometimes like a wave. And we needed a new theory to explain how this could be. So quantum, classic physics couldn't explain it. We had to develop a theory of quantum physics to you know, explain why we could have this weird behavior. And similarly, with general relativity, you know, we had Newtonian gravity, but Einstein, after developing this, this theory of special relativity, discovered, well, nothing should be able to, to travel faster than light. How is it that you know, Newtonian gravity, basically, the way it was formulated, would allow the influence of gravity to travel faster than light? He had to recast gravity in some way that where, where it would travel at a finite speed. So that's what we did, and that's where we get general relativity from, 19, and uh, year 1915. Now, so we had these two, what we call known knowns, general relativity and, and quantum physics. But actually, there, we also realized later that there is a problem, because these two theories, they're, each one of them is very successful. If we take um, experimental results, there's really no experiment that we have that um, that disagrees with quantum physics and no experiment we have that disagrees with re general relativity. But if we mathematically try to combine the two, there are incompatibilities. They basically cannot, there's not one theory that can encompass both those individual theories. Um, so basically we're left into, in this situation where we know one of those two theories must be incomplete because we can't combine them. And, and if they were complete, then they should be able to be combined. And so we have a placeholder for our ignorance. We call it the, the grand unified theory, something we don't have yet. So we've, we've named our ignorance. And uh, so this is one place where we know we don't know, um, you know what physics, uh, what the grand unification th physics would be that combines those two theories. So we have other interesting unknown unknowns. One of them, you might have heard, it, heard of it, it's called dark matter. And the, the, how we know that this exists is because if we look at distant galaxies, um, so let's take a galaxy that we see edge on like this one, we can actually measure the velocity of the stars in that galaxy by using a redshift. You can measure the redshift of the, uh, the stars. And what we'd expect is that you know, near the, you have the highest velocity near the center of the galaxy and out near the edge of the galaxy we'd see a drop off of the velocity. That's how the orb orbital mechanics should work. But guess what? That's not what we observe. The speed of the stars is constant, or almost constant, across the entire disk of the galaxy. So, you know, well, W2F. <laughs> um, 
like, well, how do we explain this? Well, there is one possible explanation. That is, if that galaxy were embedded in a sphere of matter, matter that we don't see, then that would actually explain the, the observed results of the, uh, the star velocities quite well. So we assume, based on this, that there is a, a great deal of matter in the galaxy that we don't see. So that's one of our, our known unknowns, is, is we, we, the galaxies rotate too fast, so therefore there must be something that we, we don't know. And we've named our ignorance again. We call it dark matter. Now there's another related th uh, topic, dark energy. Now a lot of the stars you see in the sky are actually in binary pairs. And if you have, if one of the partners, binary pair partners is a um, white, uh, is a white dwarf, and the other partner is a uh, red giant, like you see here. What can happen is the the matter from the red giant actually gets stripped off, and it, it falls into the white dwarf. And if that white dwarf is held up by electron degeneracy pressure, but if it gets to a certain mass, about 1.38 solar masses, electron gener degeneracy pressure isn't enough to hold up the star, so it collapses. And when it collapses, it explodes in a supernova explosion. It's called a type 1 supernova, 1A supernova, because, because it's always the same mass, it also has the same brightness, which is great because we can then determine the, uh, the distance to that, um, that supernova by using the apparent brightness to judge uh, the distance. And we can also use redshift to, f to determine the speed at which that, uh, that star had been receding from us. So we can generate this graph. If we observe enough of these type 1a supernovas, we can generate a graph where we see the, the we graph the speed of the recession of the supernova f and the distance from us. And what we expect is, now if we, there's a line here. If, if the, unif if the uni universe is expanding at a uniform rate, which we, which we had previously thought that it was, <laughs> we, would, we would hit we would expect that those, um, the stars, that the supernova explosions that we see would fall on a line. In fact, we expect that the, the line would be to the right here, which would imply a decelerating universe. So we expect the universe to be ex expanding but decelerating. Because we think that the, the mutual gravitation of all the galaxies pulling on one another should slow down the expansion of the universe. But guess what? This is not what we observe. And we, we're left in another case where we, you know, we don't know what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> because you know, it, it, what we observe does, it totally does not match what we expect to see. So what, what we found now is that not only is the universe not um, slowing down, it's the rate of expansion is actually accelerating. And earlier this month, there were, the Nobel Prize was given to three astrophysicists for, their, uh, for this um, discovery. So basically, they were given the Nobel Prize for discovering what we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is another case where classical cosmology does not agree with what we observe. Why, why? So we need some way to explain why the universe is accelerating rather than decelerating. And the name we've given to our um, ignorance is dark energy, because one of the theories is that perhaps there is an energy of empty space, which, um, as the universe grows, it's actually pushing. You know, it's a, it assert, exerts a negative pressure, which results in a, an acceleration of the universe. So, so dark energy, just because you hear that term, doesn't mean we know what that is. We, this, it's a placeholder for, for what we don't know. In fact, if we ask the question, well, what's the universe made of? <laughs> Unfortunately, matter only occupies about 4%. The other, well, 22% is dark matter, and 74% and is dark energy. So we've gone from the case you know, in 1878, where we knew everything there was to know about physics, apparently, to the case where now it seems we only know about 4% of what the universe is made of. So it seems like an odd form of progress, but this <laughs> is indeed progress because now we know what we don't know. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you very much.